Now we're going to spend some time in the Word so that together we will all appreciate what it means to be a contagious disciple. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 1, and we will be referring to it throughout the message this morning. Let us bow our heads. Father, we thank you that you're a God who loves us, you're a God who cares for us, you're a God who has given us a message of hope for a world that is hopeless and a world that is slowly ebbing away to destruction. We pray, God, that you will bless your people today, wherever they are uh, listening to this program. And now, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O God, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. When you hear the word evangelism, what comes to your mind? And uh, there are many things that can come to your mind. But evangelism, from my perspective today, is telling people they matter to the Father. The love of Christ is so at work in the lives of us that we become contagious to tell others about the love of the Father. And in a simple way, that's evangelism. Do you know what's great about that? We can be ourselves while we do it. You don't have to embrace anybody else's personality. You don't have to embrace anybody else's style. You just need to be yourself. And God is such a good God. God knew what he was doing when he made us. He gave us the exact personality. And you heard a bit about that last night and this morning about personalities. He wanted you to have the kind of personality you have. So don't try to change your personality to somebody else's. Just be who you are and share the love of Jesus through your personality with those you come into contact with. When we look at 1 Thessalonians we would discover that Paul was writing a letter to a small congregation in an ancient Greek city that was making a worldwide impact for Jesus Christ. If there was ever a contagious congregation, it was that little church in Thessalonica. If ever there were contagious disciples, it was those people in that church, we call the Thessalonians. Their love for Jesus Christ was contagious. Their love for Jesus Christ was infectious. So much so that they were known throughout the Roman Empire. In every place, said Paul, their faith in God had sounded forth so that Paul had no need to tell about them. They were contagious disciples. They caught the love of Jesus and then urgently and infectiously offered it to anyone they came into contact with. They didn't discriminate when it came to sharing the gospel. Whoever they met, wherever they met them, they told them that God loved them. That's the gospel. And so the Thessalonian church teaches us three things about being contagious disciples. Number one, and for those who love to write, you notice I would pause. Contagious disciples are infected by Jesus. Contagious disciples are infected by Jesus. Number two, Contagious disciples are infectious for Jesus. Contagious disciples are infectious for Jesus. So they are infected by Jesus and they are infectious for Jesus. And then number three, contagious disciples are devoted to Jesus. So I'll repeat them one more time. They are infected by Jesus they are infectious for Jesus, and they are devoted to Jesus. Let's 
explore that for a little bit. Let's look at verses 1 to 4 of First Thessalonians. I am reading from the New King James Version. To the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. Now, the Apostle Paul describes the Christian believers in Thessalonica as chosen. The word he uses in verse 4 is chosen. The uh, New King James Version uses that same word. It says election. Now, in considering the passage, Paul is not so much concerned with debating all the implications of how or when God chooses. Paul leaves that aside. Let's not get into that Paul is saying then. His purpose is to remind the believers that it is God who chose them. As we consider the passage, we recognize right there that God is the one who does the choosing. And God provides the framework for us understanding the concept of divine election. God, my dear friends, chose Abraham and his descendants. He chose them in order to make himself known to the rest of humanity, to the rest of mankind. Israel, God's chosen people, was called to enjoy God's favor and to be a light to the nations. That's Israel. Israel was called to reveal God's merciful salvation to the world. Now, we can spend the rest of the day here talking about whether Israel did what God chose them to do. But the point remains, based on what the Bible tells us, that God chose them for a specific purpose. Now, you and I need to begin to ask ourselves the question, did God choose me? And if he did, why? Well, I can declare beyond the shadow of a doubt that I believe that God has chosen me. And he has chosen me as a child of the living God, a disciple of Jesus Christ, to tell the world that he loves them. And that should be the way we should see it. God loves everyone and he has chosen us a peculiar people sent forth into the world to be contagious disciples for Jesus Christ. Paul is declaring to the Thessalonian Christians that just as God chose Israel, God has called each of them. And their lives confirm their calling to be light in this world. One important thing for us to know is that we are saved. I often ask, are you saved? Are you saved? It's not rhetorical, it's real now. When I ask my Pentecostal friends, and I have friends in every denomination that you could call, including the Muslims, because that's the area that I love to speak about. When I ask them, are you saved? They're able to, especially my Pentecostal friends, they're able to respond positively. Yes, I'm saved. Now, we understand their concept well. And when we get it, we should understand that we are not quite like where they are. We are a little further than that. Because every day I wake up, I drop on my knees and I pray. And I ask God, I thank him for the night that has gone. And I ask him to forgive me where I've gone wrong and to give me power to live in this new day. I am saved as a result of that. God sees me for who I am and the blood of Jesus Christ has covered me. And, and Jesus presents me before the Father and he, as though I had never sinned for that day. Wow. So I know I am saved. Do you know that you're truly born again? 
You might ask, how can I know? Well, what is the evidence that I'm truly converted? Paul, speaking to the Thessalonians in, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, reminds them of it. And we can read that passage on our own. But the point that Paul is making in that passage is that the entire plan of salvation was born not in my heart, nor your heart, nor the seven-day Adventist church. It was born in the heart of God. We are not part of that plan until we accept Jesus Christ into the plan. You see, we didn't make the plan. God made the plan. Long before we were born, long before we were created, God made a plan that his son Jesus Christ will come for adventure. Sin came into the world. And his son will die for you and for me. So I know that. That's why I can declare that I'm saved. I can declare that my God loves me and cares for me. So that plan of salvation was born in the heart of God. God loves me so much that there was Calvary. I hear people bemoan from time to time. Well, preacher, I'm unworthy of God's love. Let me, uh, just give me some time. Let me fix myself up. Let me clean myself up. And then I'll come. That is not correct. We can do nothing to fix ourselves up. No, clean ourselves up. We all need Jesus to clean us up and to fix us up. So when we hear the gospel, we need to respond. Run to Jesus, we say. Let Jesus do it. And so I commend the two young people who got baptized this morning that they did not uh, tell the pastor or their parents, well, I'll wait until a more convenient season. Sometimes that con convenient season never comes. And I've seen it in the lives of parents crying, uh, saying, Pastor, my daughter wanted to get baptized at the age of 13. And I stood in the way and said, no, they're not ready yet. And that child is not yet a, a member of the body of Christ. So I commend him. Jesus made it possible for all of us. God, the Bible says in Romans 3, 8, sorry, 5, 8, God demonstrate his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, who died? Who died? Christ died for us, not me. Oh, when I die, I go to the grave and wait the resurrection. But I know somebody, his name is Jesus who died to redeem me from my sins. I know the story because the Bible tells me so, and I trust the word of the living God that it is true. The evidence is there. I went to the empty tomb. I walked into it, and there is no bones there. It's empty. It's clean. My Jesus is alive. He died, and he rose the third day, and he's ascended back to the Father in heaven, where he intercedes on my behalf, that's grace for me. For by grace, the Apostle Paul writing again in, in Romans says, For by grace are you saved. Not anything good you have done. Not anything good I have done. But because of whom? Jesus Christ. It is a gift. When you get a gift, do you try to pay for that gift? Tell me. Talk to me now. Do you try to pay for that gift? No, it's a gift. So you don't try to pay for that gift. You don't try to give back something because of that gift. No, that's not the right concept. Gifts are to be embraced. Take them for what they are. Some gifts we get, we don't even deserve them. But we get them, isn't that so? Good. Now, in this context here, the plan of salvation born in the heart of God through Jesus Christ dying on Calvary for each of us. We didn't deserve it. We should have all been punished. We should all die. But Jesus Christ died so that I can have what? Life and have it more abundantly. So I am saved. I can say that. And when I am infected with that grace that Jesus Christ have given to me, I can keep 
quiet about it. I've got to tell somebody about it. That's what we need to be doing. Because we know that God loves us so much. And we are infected by Jesus Christ. So now we need to become infectious for Jesus Christ. Now, let me slow it down here. I cannot become infectious unless I am infected. In other words, I cannot tell you what I don't know and experience, right? Learning takes place this way. Moving people from the known to the unknown. Isn't that so? So when I know it, I can help somebody else to get to know it. When I experience it, I can talk about it. You with me? Good. So I am infected with the love of Jesus Christ. So now I can become infectious as I tell others about the love of Jesus Christ. Is that there in the passage? Yes. Look at verse 6 of 1 Thessalonians. It says, and you became followers of us and of whom? The Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. Wow. You received the word with joy. They became, one translation says, they became imitators of the apostles and of the Lord. That is, they became more like Christ every day. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, contagious disciples become more like Christ. And when we become more like Christ, we impact the world. We can't be the same. And those around us would always know that we are different. And they would ask us, what caused you to be different? And you have an opportunity. You're going to hear more of that this afternoon in the, in the presentations by Pastor Keith. You have an opportunity to tell them using your own personality of what Jesus Christ has done for you. Telling your own story. Folks, my testimony is not your testimony. So don't try to take my testimony. Don't try to take my story and use it in your own experience. Use your testimony to tell people of how Jesus Christ has brought you to the light and how you would like to see them move on from there. Tell them that you have been infected so that they can become infected by Jesus Christ also. The Thessalonians made a glorious mark on the world. Why? Because Christ lived in them and Christ controlled them. Well, Wow. You know, it was Billy Graham who said these words. Our greatest need today is not more Christianity, but more true Christians. Not more Christianity, but more Christians. The world can argue, my friends, against Christianity as an institution. But there is no convincing argument against a person who through the Spirit of God has been made Christ-like. Contagious disciples infect the world with God's love because they are becoming more like Jesus Christ. And if you are infected by Jesus Christ, people will see because there will be joy in your life experience even when you're going through difficulties. Yes, you would be happy and joyful. Not only would you be happy and joyful, but you would also be different. Now, let me ask you this question. Do you like being around joyful people? All of us. Can joyful people infect us? Yes, they can. And that's what Christ wants us to do. 
as we are happy, we can rub off that happiness on others and tell them why we are so happy even when we are in the worst situation. You know, sometimes we have difficult days, right? You have a family member who is sick. Life is not always going to deal you strawberries and grape. Sometimes you're going to get some sour lemons. Don't take the sour lemons and throw them out. As the one, one person said, make some lemonade. Tell somebody that you can go through this because of the love of Jesus Christ. There are times when we have family members who die. And we don't understand why they die at the early age they die. But because of the love of Jesus Christ residing in our hearts, we can face the difficult days and tell those who are, 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 are hurting much more than we are of why we can face it with a smile on our face because we have a joy, a happiness that comes because of Jesus residing in our hearts. We have a joy and a hope that one day, death too will be eradicated. That there will be no more cemeteries. There will be no more need for the, the funeral parlors. Because Jesus will put an end to that. People will notice it. Uh, people noticed the Thessalonian believers. Here's what Paul says in verse 7. He says, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believed. For in verse 8 also, for from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth. Thank you. Not only in Macedonia, but also in every place. So, you became an example. They became examples. Paul said to the Brethren, but I want to pick up on a point that Paul makes here. He said, The Lord's message rang in verse 8. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known where? Everywhere. Not only in Ottawa, but in all of the surrounding villages and cities and towns. People have come to know who you are. How do we understand that? You see, the word in the original that is used for uh, what we have here sounded out or rang out is where in English we get the word echo. All right? So we echo. Those of us who have the love of Jesus Christ residing in us, those of us who have been infected by Jesus Christ, as we become infectious, we echo God's truth as we hear it from Him. Now, what does an echo do? Huh? What does it do? Echoes repeat what the original is spoken about. So when you hear the echo down the road, you, oh, that's the echo from that speaker. Or that's the echo from that singer. Echoing what God has done for you. God has put his voice in us to echo his love to the rest of the world. Now, if you don't have the right message or the right tune, the echo will give that too. So it is incumbent upon us as contagious disciples of Jesus Christ to have the right message so that we can echo that message to the world. Now I want you to recognize that all through all I've said so far, I have not referred to us as members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I know somebody might be wondering, well, why is he not saying that? Well, I want us to walk further than being a member 
of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I am happy to be a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But I want to be more than that. I want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You see, it's good to be a member of the church. But Jesus Christ in the book of Matthew chapter 28 didn't just call us to be a part of the body of Christ, Seventh-day Adventist Church. He has called us to be what? Disciples and has commissioned us to go and make other disciples for Jesus Christ. Disciples do not leave. Wow. Let me say that again. Disciples do not leave. Disciples stay with the master teacher all the time. Members leave. When members are not satisfied or happy with what is happening. But disciples do not leave. They stay with the master all the time because he is the master discipler. He is the master teacher. So have the right message and echo that message. Let's think about it because that's what we need to be if we are to be infectious for Jesus Christ. When we think of the Thessalonian church and we think of this issue of echoing, we got to remember something that the Apostle Paul speaks about. Because this church in Thessalonica went through some very difficult time. And somebody may want to argue, well, they were, they were enjoying life. No. That's not correct. If you want to be real, study the Thessalonian church. They knew what real life was all about. And of all the churches that are mentioned by name in the New Testament, there are only two that receive commendations from Paul and Jesus with little or no criticism. And they were the Philippians. In spite of great poverty, Paul says they remain true and faithful to God. And the second church was the Thessalonians. They had to endure intense persecution for their faith and were constantly bombarded with the temptation to just go along with the world in its godless system. But you know what? They lived in that society that was so godless, a society that was devoid of a moral compass. And every day the Thessalonian brethren were, were confronted with the overwhelming temptation to compromise their faith and their testimony, but they did not. And we praise God for that. They lived through difficult times. They were a poor church. Many of the believers in Thessalonians were slaves. They had lost their livelihoods when they became Christians. And add to all of this, they had to endure persecution for their faith. Yet, they stood faithful to Jesus Christ. That's being real. And Paul makes it clear to us that in spite of all of these things bombarding them, they became infectious for Jesus Christ. So much so that all of the surrounding nations heard about them even before they met them. We need to be like the church in Thessalonica. We need to be infectious for Jesus Christ. So we need to be infected by Jesus Christ. We need to be infectious for Jesus Christ. And we need to be devoted to Jesus Christ. Look at verses 9 and 10 of First Thessalonians. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you. And how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Wow. They were devoted to Jesus Christ. In other words, we need to entrust our today with Jesus Christ. But you didn't get that. We need to entrust Jesus 
with our today. Tomorrow is gone. Yesterday is gone. All right? But we got today. The question is, do you trust Jesus with your today? If you are devoted to Jesus Christ, we need to entrust him with our today. That's why we begin the day with prayer. Hmm? Disciples of Jesus Christ begin the day with a devotion. Entrusting the day to him. But we don't stop there, right? Isn't that so? We must also entrust him with tomorrow. In spite of what happens today, we must also entrust him with our tomorrow. Because we don't know what tomorrow holds. But he knows what tomorrow holds. Look at what the passage says in verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven. They entrusted their lives into tomorrow. Into the hand of God. They wait from heaven for the son whom God had raised from the dead. Even Jesus who delivered us from the wrath to come. They entrusted their today into the hand of Jesus as devoted disciples. And they entrusted their tomorrow into the hand of Jesus as devoted disciples. Just as importantly, my dear friends, as contagious disciples have entrusted uh, uh, Jesus with their tomorrow, uh, Paul says they wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. In other words, the Thessalonians were absolutely convinced that the only way to live was through Jesus Christ. And they were equally convinced that the only way to die was in Jesus Christ. Now let, me, let me say that again because for me that's important. And I hope you get it. The only way to live was through Jesus Christ. And the only way to die was in Jesus Christ. Why? If I entrust my today in the hand of Jesus Christ, I'm living today through him. And if I die, I die in him with an understanding that one day, the resurrection and the life, his name is Jesus, will call me by name wherever I was in turn. And I, because I have been faithful, but more importantly, because Jesus loves me, I would see Jesus again. That's why I have to entrust my tomorrow in Jesus Christ. The challenge is many of us may entrust our today, but we are afraid to entrust our tomorrow into the hand of Jesus Christ. I want to challenge us as believers, as contagious disciples, to devote ourselves to Jesus Christ by entrusting our today and our tomorrow. Jesus needs contagious congregations like you that live out his love so that Ottawa will be changed by our influence. Jesus calls on every one of us listening to my voice to understand that we are called to a higher calling. We are called to be contagious disciples who would be infected by Jesus Christ, who would be infectious for Jesus Christ, who would be devoted for Jesus Christ by giving not only our today, but our tomorrow to him. So no matter what may happen, rest assured, my life, is in the hand of the master. Sometimes the devil would come after us to take us out. But Jesus is there to take him out. Or oh, don't forget that the battle was won on Calvary. I praise God for that. 
Won't it for Calvary? I'll not be able to stand before you here. You see, you don't know what my life was like in the past. I, I was not rough, but I was not easy. I tell you that I was a radical. Every now and again, if you push me too hard, a little bit of it still comes out. Because Jesus is still working with me. Oh, I'm not where I need to be, but I'm not where I used to be. I praise God for that because I am learning each day to devote my today into his hand and my tomorrow into his hand. And I want to challenge all of us to do the same so that we, friends, would understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. My dear brothers and sisters, accepting Jesus as Savior is just not enough. Hmm. I want you to think about that. That's why I stopped right there. I'll repeat it. Accepting Jesus as Savior is just not enough. There are folks everywhere who have accepted Jesus but stop right there. Remember, Jesus wants you to become like him. Jesus wants you and I to experience deeper levels of joy. He wants people to notice the difference he has made in our lives. Yes, he does. And you may throw your hand up and say, well, I can't do it. Well, let me share this brief story as I conclude. The young salesman was disappointed about losing a big sale that day. That day he had talked with a bigger salesman to get that salesman to purchase from his company, but it didn't work. And so as he went back to the office, he lamented the situation with his manager. And the words, I guess, I just proved. He said to the manager, you can lead a horse to the water, but you can't make him drink it. You know that expression. Well, my dear brothers and sisters, the manager who was a Christian replied, Son, take my advice. Your job is not to make him drink. Your job is to make him thirsty. Brothers and sisters, our job is not to make them drink. Our job is to make them thirsty for Jesus Christ. When people become thirsty for Jesus Christ, they can't help but run to that place where they can get that water of life freely like the Samaritan woman and say, now give me so that I can never thirst again. When people become thirsty, they'll run to the villagers and say, Come, see a man who has told me things I've done all through my life. Come. His name is Jesus Christ. My dear brothers and sisters, I question, uh, my question to each of us is, are you willing to live your life in such a way that will cause people to become thirsty for Jesus Christ? Is there somebody here who want to say, Preacher, I want to be a contagious disciple. I want to live my life so that people will become thirsty for Jesus Christ. If you want to do that, you want to join me on your feet. You just want to stand where you are. It's not a call to join the church. It's a call for Jesus to be able to become infected, infectious, and devoted so that you can cause people to be thirsty for the love of Jesus Christ. And as they become thirsty, they will indeed want to hear about Jesus. Let us pray. Father, these are your people. Thank you. Thank you for their response. Thank you for all those who have been listening to your word. So that we can all become contagious disciples for you. We recognize it's just not enough to accept you. We need to walk with you 
and that journey become like you as we cause people to become thirsty for you. Bless your people today, O oh God, wherever they are listening in. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.